now I have today's reading. It's by Matt Hogan and is titled How to Break the Cycle of Harm to Our Boys and Men. One of the most harmful phrases we can use with boys as they are being tried, failing, hurt, or experimenting with life is be a man. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous phrases in the English language. This phrase, which is representative of a deeper rooted mentality of how some boys are treated and raised, has some very toxic and harmful assumptions that come with it. When a boy is told to be a man, it implies that he should fight back, suppress his emotions, show no pain, and never, ever cry. These subtle cues, especially when given repeatedly and intentionally over time, can lead to damaging and very real long-term effects, including depression, anxiety, and violence. Now, I will introduce our speaker, Kevin Fisher who has served as the executive director of NAMI Michigan since 2014, the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. A mental health and suicide prevention advocate, Karen, Kevin is the founder and director of the Dominique Fisher Memorial Foundation and the CEO of Everybody versus Stigma.com. He also serves on the board of directors of several behavioral health organizations throughout Michigan, including Governor Whitmer's Suicide Prevention Commission, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Mental Health Diversion Council, and Behavioral Health Advisory Council, Disability Rights Michigan, and Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness Advisory Board. And he's also the president of the Crisis Intervention Team International. Welcome, Kevin. Good morning and thank you for having me. I am going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, if everyone can see that and get started. Uh, as Regina mentioned um, in my bio, I wear many hats, and um, that is because this has become my passion. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about NAMI, uh, invite you to um, join us, uh, and then talk a little bit about what I call eliminating toxic masculinity. So as Regina mentioned, NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization. Uh, we started in 1979, and I'm going to pause for a second, and uh, I just want to acknowledge all of the women uh, joining us today. March is International uh, Women's uh, Month, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that NAMI was actually started by a group of mothers in 1979 who uh, did not feel that their children had access to behavioral health resources that were needed. And so they gathered around a kitchen table and created what we now know as the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We still affectionately re refer to these mothers as the NAMI mommies, um, because I very strongly believe um, that if you really wanna get something done, get a group of mothers together and they will make it happen. So why is this so important to me? Unfortunately, my oldest son, Dominique, was diagnosed with very serious mental illness in 2007. Dominique was 20 years old. He was a sophomore attending John Carroll University. And um, prior to that, had really exhibited no symptoms of mental illness that his mom or I had recognized. He came home from school uh, for Thanksgiving break that year and was not himself, and after we took him to the hospital, thinking that maybe he had um, maybe experimented with drugs or alcohol at school and had a bad reaction, we were informed after a lengthy uh, evaluation that 
he had no drugs or alcohol in his system, um, but he was going to be put on a 72 hour psychiatric hold. Um, and obviously that was really surprising to us. Dominique was ultimately diagnosed bipolar schizophrenic. And for the next several years, we really struggled with understanding uh, what his diagnosis meant, uh, what resources were available, what a treatment plan would look like, and really what his life would look like going forward. Unfortunately, that struggle came to an end on June 27th of 2010, when Dominique died by suicide. So one of the things that I learned um, from this journey with Dominique was one, how little we know and how little we understand mental illness, how it affects us men uh, and the stigmas associated with it. And you'll hear me use the term stigma over and over today because stigma is the leading barrier that prevents people from taking the first steps to seeking the help that they need. And that is universal, but it is also very unique to men. And for some of the reasons that Regina has already mentioned today, I'll also, be sharing my very personal story because beyond Dominique's experience with mental illness and subsequent death by suicide, because of this toxic masculinity that we live with, that men are protectors and providers and we're supposed to be strong and silent and not talk about our feelings, I didn't handle um, my grief after losing Dominique very well. And I literally came within hours of taking my own life by suicide. And one of the things that I learned during that process was how unnecessary it was for me to suffer in silence alone. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that today as well. One in five Americans are affected by mental illness annually. And with this most recent pandemic, those numbers have actually been exacerbated. And I'm going to give you a few statistics. I try not to go too heavy into statistics because um, because sometimes they're boring, uh, but obviously they're very informative. So we're going to talk a little bit about statistics, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what um, men face and, and hopefully some remedies. So one of the things that we really need to understand about mental illness is mental illness is brought on by a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors. Honestly, we don't know all the reasons um, that cause mental illness. We do know that we all have what I call a mental health gene. And the question becomes, what's your trigger? Sometimes it could be biological or hereditary. Sometimes it can be induced by uh, trauma. Uh, we, we talk a lot about PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we think about that mostly in terms of veterans or active military. But the fact is, we all can uh, be subject to PTSD because we all face traumas in our lives. And then there are other social factors, uh, uh, substance use, many other factors that contribute to triggering mental illness. I want us all to understand that mental illness does not discriminate, not by race, religion, social, uh, socioeconomic status, um, uh, party affiliation, sex or sexual identification, doesn't care if you're urban, suburban, or rural, mental illness simply does not discriminate. We also know that 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness onsets by the age of 14, 75% by the age of 24. This is important because it's really important for us to understand that we need to pay attention to the behavioral health of our young people. And we need to make sure that our young people understand that it's okay not to be okay. I know that sounds a little cliche to some, but it is. And that we as parents and, and caregivers need to listen. And when we notice something is wrong, then we should not be afraid to get a mental health evaluation any more than we would be afraid. If you notice someone was experiencing a shortness of breath, um, you wouldn't have any trouble taking them to an emergency room or an urgent care for an evaluation. So one of the myths we need to understand about mental illness is the fact that, or we should dispel, 
is the fact that mental illness is actually a medical diagnosis. It is not a personal weakness or choice. 75% of people who are affected by mental illness tell us that they've been victim of stigma. I mentioned before, I personally and NAMI as an organization believes that stigma is the leading barrier that prevents the early diagnosis and treatment that leads to better outcomes. We should think about mental illness the way we do other physical diagnoses. For example, a diagnosis of cancer that is caught at stage one shows better uh, opportunity for recovery than if it's first diagnosed at stage four. Mental illness is very similar. The earlier we diagnose and get treatment, the better the outcomes can be. I sit, talked a little bit about mental illness does not discriminate, but neither does stigma. Stigma does not discriminate, but it does vary by community and culture. And yes, even by sex, um, and we're gonna talk about that today because men and women experience stigma differently and we address it very differently. A few uh, last statistics that I wanna um, share with you because it affects men more than women is 70% of the population in our juvenile justice system experience uh, at least one mental health condition. 20% experience a serious mental illness. Um, many may not know that in the state of Michigan, the Wayne County Jail is considered the largest mental health treatment facility in the state. And that's not unusual in Michigan or in Detroit proper because if you go to Ohio, it's the Cuyahoga County Jail. If you go to Illinois, it's the Cook County Jail. If you go to California, it's the Los Angeles County Jail and so on. Somehow our jails and prison systems have become the de facto behavioral health treatment facilities. Um, and there is nothing right about that because those jails are primarily filled with men who have mental health conditions, many of which who've not committed violent crimes or even felonies, but they fill those jails. And we need to do a better job of providing proactive treatment eliminating the stigma so we can get people help on an outpatient basis and they not um, interact in our criminal justice system. I mentioned before that stigma varies by culture and community. Um, in communities of color, we are far less likely to receive effective behavioral health care treatment than the general population. Also, in our communities as a whole, 20% of homeless adults living in shelters live with serious mental illness. 46% live with co-occurring um, diagnosis. So typically substance use disorder and mental illness. So when we talk about how do we alleviate uh, the homelessness situation in the, in the United States or hunger, we can start by addressing mental illness, which is at the root of much of that. You know, my dad was a World War II veteran. And the reason that's important is because his generation absolutely did not talk about feelings. As a matter of fact, I never remember hearing my dad say, I love you. Now, let me be clear about that. There has never been a moment in my life that I did not know my dad loved me. He just didn't say the words because that wasn't uh, a part of the culture of his era. And I found this photo um, last year on the internet that really resonated with me because for men, our neighbors, our mothers, our friends, no one ever talks to men and say, let's talk. Let's talk about how you're feeling. And what we need to understand is that not talking and suppressing all of those emotions is not only damaging to our relationships, but it actually affects the quality of our life and our lifespan. If we don't get these emotions out, if we don't deal with mental illness or any of the other issues that we're facing because we've been taught 
to be strong and silent, it can literally kill us. That's why men experience higher rates of heart disease and hypertension and other uh, chronic diseases. According to the National Wellbeing Study, and this should come as no surprise to any of us, men have a lower life satisfaction uh, rate than women. Um, men are most at risk of suicide between the ages of 45 and 59. Um, we are 73% of missing adults are men. 87% of rough sleepers are men. Um, men are three times more likely than women to become dependent on alcohol and drugs, 60%, um, and, and you can read through the statistics. Because of the stigma of this toxic masculinity, because of this man up culture that we live in, um, men's lives are tremendously negatively impacted. And this is something that we can change. Men are, because of a, of a variety of factors, again, associated with this toxic masculinity because we are to be protectors and providers. And we're, when we're not able to do that, we tend to leave the home. And ch children of fatherless homes account for 63% of youth suicides, 90% of all homeless runaway youth, 85% of children that exhibit be, um, behavioral health disorders, 71% of all high school dropouts, 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions, which are typically foster care and the juvenile justice system, 75% of adolescent patients with substance, in substance use centers, and even 75% of rapists who are motivated by displaced anger. So we have a tremendous impact on our families and our behavioral health well-being um, impacts that significantly. Depression is the um, largest cause of suicide in the world. Depression is one of the top mental health, uh, mental illnesses in the nation, uh, and that includes men. And men's depression is most unlikely to go undiagnosed, one, because we are least likely to raise our hand and say that we need help. We're least likely um, to submit to a mental health evaluation or treatment. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in the United States for in the general population uh, for anyone between the ages of 10 and 34. It is the seventh leading cause of death for men overall. And while generally men account for 75% of all deaths by suicide, even though women attempt suicide at two to three times um, a rate more than men. And the reason for that difference is because men tend to use more lethal methods when attempting suicide. Unfortunately, however, in the last five or six years, we've noticed that women are starting to close the gap. So I don't want um, the statistic or the numbers to be misleading because we're very concerned, um, particularly about teenage girls now. Common barriers to seeking treatment include the importance of family privacy. We don't want our friends, coworkers, even the people we worship with at church to know that we're experiencing uh, mental health challenges. And so again, that's one of the factors that prevent us from seeking the help that we need. Concerns about stigma, concerns about taking medication, um, not having appropriate information about services, providers, treatment programs that are available in our communities significantly impact. And then once we are willing to seek help, any dehumanizing treatment during that process will prevent you from seeking help. Um, again, we know that we men struggle with um, talking about what we're experiencing. 
And so when you're willing to face that challenge and when you go for treatment or if you confide in a friend or a loved one and you are your concerns are displaced, as uh, Regina mentioned earlier, if we again say man up, you know, be a man, um, you know, that continues to deflate us and prevent us from seeking help and ever raising it again. When a person is experiencing a mental health challenge, uh, it is essential that we receive quality and culturally competent care. And culturally competent care is something that since the pandemic over the last two years has come up over and over again. And I wanna pause here and caution us to understand that while yes, it, it, it would be great to receive care from and for me, for example, from an African-American male behavioral health care provider, the fact that a provider may not look like me, may not be African-American, may not be male, should not prevent me from seeking care. There is a tremendous shortage of behavioral health professionals uh, in the United States. And so again, while it, it would be nice if we had access to exactly what we wanted, or at least what we think we want and need, we shouldn't let that deter us from seeking help when we need it because it can, again, improve the quality of our lives and in many cases, save lives. It's also important to know what to look for when we're seeking or receiving services from a behavioral health care professional or any medical professional. Uh, we should come away and be able to ask ourselves some really important questions and feel comfortable that we've been uh, received competent tr treatment and sense treatment that's sensitive to our concerns. And if you don't feel that you're treated with respect, then try another provider, but don't give up. Though there are some daunting and disappointing statistics, what we do know is that every day, people who seek and receive uh, appropriate treatment go on to live better lives. And we need to make sure that our men understand that it's okay not to be okay. And it's okay to confide in loved ones and if necessary, seek professional treatment. We need to create a community or society where men understand it's safe to be emotionally vulnerable. And I learned that myself. Um, throughout my experience. You know, it's, it's funny and, and, and in some ways sad to say, you know, shout out to all the men who are going through a lot with no one to turn to because the world wrongly taught us to mask our emotions and that strong means silent. I was going through a challenge in the early 2000 and it was the first time that I'd seek um, professional counseling. And my first two or three visits, I remember telling my counselor all of the issues that I was facing. And as we were wrapping up the session, he paused and, and said, Kevin, you're telling me about you're taking care of your mom and you're taking care of your family and you have, you know, your career and all of these other things to take care of. And he asked, where do you go when you need a soft place to land? And I had never even thought of that before. And I was 45 years old when he asked me that question because I always believed that I was always supposed to be okay and take care of others and not acknowledge my, the stresses that I was experiencing. So it's a simple question, but it's a very powerful question. And we should have a resource to go to. We should have someone that we're confident in that care about us and we should be able to talk about what were the struggles we face. Men need to know that it's okay to cry, to need support, to be vulnerable, to go to therapy, uh, to talk about our feelings, to ask for help. And it's okay to break down. I remember after losing Dominique, I was working out at the local gym and I was, uh, I was on a, a treadmill and I thought if I sweat enough, no one could notice that I was crying. 
and a young lady came by and asked if I was okay. And uh, some other patrons there who knew I'd lost my son came by because she was really concerned and they said, it's okay. We know what's going on with him. And they were, I didn't know they were keeping an eye out for me. I didn't realize that they cared enough to, even though some may not have been comfortable approaching me, that they were watching to make sure that I was okay. So we need to understand that it's okay not to be okay. I am a very strong believer in faith plus. Um, I believe faith is a part of our recovery. I believe spirituality is a part of that. Um, NAMI has created um, and provides a program called FaithNet. And it simply creates a community of people of faith who may be experiencing behavioral health challenges and also recognize that their faith is a part of their recovery. Unfortunately, daily I run into people who will not seek professional behavioral health care help because they believe their faith prohibits them from doing so. And I think we need to change that. As Regina mentioned earlier, and you've heard me mention um, many times, I believe that stigma is the leading barrier that simply prevents people from seeking the help that they need. Because of that, about a year ago, my wife and I created a company um, called Everybody Versus Stigma, and it is just that. Um, we mean everybody. And we truly believe that if we eliminate the stigma associated with mental illness and normalize the conversation, the world would be a better place. I've talked a lot about men. I wanna talk about our partners for a second. Um, I came across a meme on social media uh, about, again, about a year or so ago. You know, we had a lot of time on social media while we were social isolating. Um, and I, I came across the statement that said, having the right person by your side will have you saving money, living better, uh, making moves and laughing constantly. The one thing that I would add to that is um, having the right person in my life made, brought me back, frankly, to my faith. When I lost Dominique again, I, there was a period of time where I couldn't bring myself to go to church. And it was because, not because I lost my faith, but because I thought I failed God and I didn't feel like I had the right to enter his house. And my wife would every Sunday come to me and say, Kevin, the kids and I are going to church. And she didn't nag me. She would just say, Kevin, the kids and I are going to church. You should come with us. She knew I needed to be there. And it took a while before I got back to the place where I really realized that's where I needed to be. So one of my favorite um, sayings that my pastor has said is, he said, you know, often women will take you to the mall, they'll take you, you know, to the club, they'll do that. He said, but a good woman will take you to church. And that's exactly what my wife has done for me. And so I say that, and, and, and I say this with the deepest of respect, if you have, well, I'll just say it this way, for our spouses, have a conversation with your husbands, your fathers, your sons, and make sure they understand that it's okay. And if we come to you and we're, and we're prepared to talk, we need you to be prepared to listen in, a, in the most non-judgmental way possible, because often you only get one shot. And if we feel like our feelings are not being taken, um, seriously or respectfully, we won't come back again. And that starts that whole cycle of toxic masculinity again. So I've been very blessed um, that my wife understands. Uh, she knows when I'm having a bad day. She's seen me cry many, many times. Um, and she encourages me to come and talk to her when I need to. Uh, and that has truly been a blessing for me. So I'm going to wrap up with uh, inviting you uh, to join your local NAMI affiliate. NAMI Southwest Michigan is based there in Kalamazoo. This is their contact information. Um, 
our, this particular affiliate provides NAMI programming and all of NAMI education and support um, programs are provided at no cost to participants. Um, and they provide um, this affiliate from Kalamazoo all the way to Bering Springs, Benton Harbor area. And then there's a couple of NAMI events if you're interested in volunteering or, or becoming a part of our annual state conference and our NAMI walks event in Grand Rapids uh, in October. Um, there are a couple of resources here, of course, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the NAMI helplines. Um, one in particular for men that I find really helpful is called Man Therapy. It is, all, it is sponsored by SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Authority. And so I encourage you to visit that for more resources. And this is my contact information. So um, it's a little awkward presenting virtually um, when you're sitting in a room by yourself, but I hope uh, I was able to share some meaningful information with you today. I thank you for your presence and participation and your time. And I look forward to our Q&A session. Thank you.